the most negatively correlated asset to gold is the stock market. So if the stock market's making new highs, it doesn't mean gold should be making new lows, but it does imply that gold shouldn't be doing as well as it is. So if gold is doing this well in a stock market that's also doing well, it's indicating to me with all my years of study that we're really going to see something on the next major leg up. Because gold is forecasting, markets look to the future, that um, there's, there's a lot that's going to take place in the next I would say a few years regarding the precious metals. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host on this channel. And I'm really looking forward to catching up with an old friend of the channel. It's David Morgan. He's the founder, publisher, editor over at The Morgan Report. Really somebody I look forward to chatting with every time we get him on because uh, he's the silver guru on Twitter. So his, his, his Twitter handle, of course, leads to a, a, a big part of our discussion today. We're going to lead in with some macro questions. We're going to see, uh, we're going to discuss the gold and silver price action over the last couple of weeks. Really interesting move. Uh, the day we're recording this here, August 15th here, it seems like we have an everything rally going on. Gold is up, silver is up, copper is up, the US dollar is up. Uh, all the main indices are up as well. So I'm wondering what, what, what is going on? Like, uh, what, what did I miss? Of course, retail sales numbers came out this morning, but uh, I don't think that explains the full picture. And I'm curious what uh, David's thoughts are on uh, the, the overall economic situation, not just in the US, but probably globally as well. Uh, what, what is driving markets? What's driving precious metals prices now? And uh, before I switch over to my guest, enough of my intro, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously bringing guests like David onto the show. And uh, with that said and out of the way, David, it is great to have you back on. Good to see you, my friend. Well, Kai, it's been a while. Thank you for having me. Yeah, five months. I was looking it up earlier when our last conversation happened, and uh, I was in our studio in Vancouver, and uh, when we, when we taped the last conversation, so yeah, that's right. uh, lots to catch up on. And uh, but I, re I really want to focus on the last couple of weeks at the beginning here and uh, ask you about like what, what happened with gold and silver. What was, how do you sort of what what do you make of the price action in the markets, of gold and silver in particular, over the last couple of weeks? Well, I. have been far from perfect, but I've been, you know, fairly accurate over the years. I mean, I put my my calls against anyone. And uh, I said a few months ago that, you know, once the summer hit, I saw a trading range, which is really what we've been in. Uh, I also said that uh, August is seasonality wise, the low for gold or silver or both, usually not every time. And that um, I didn't expect a lot of uh, you know, a lot of new buying, a lot of uh, talk about the gold and silver markets, really. And that's kind of what we've had. Gold's been, you know, knocking the door on hitting new highs. Uh, if you go into futures market, you claim, you know, in the near months, it's uh, making a new high, which it is on paper. But uh, un not, nothing unexpected for me other than uh, the gold-silver ratio. Once, you know, silver made it above 30, I didn't really expect it to stay there. But it did a pretty good job of staying there for a while. But when it started to come down uh, and the trading ranges were established, I really thought that silver's gold silver ratio would hang around 80. And it's been as high as 87 recently. So certainly gold is uh, performing better than silver uh, at this point in time and continues through the summer. Uh, yet the setup in silver right now looks, looks more, much more bullish than bearish. <laughs> let's talk about like price drivers in, in, in gold and silver um, maybe we'll start with gold like because there has been that divergence that you mentioned as well like what is really driving gold right now if you look at the chart over the last you know almost 10 trading days here now like w what is driving it yeah I mean this sounds real trite but it's true and that's you know any market moves on buying pressure or selling pressure and of course when you're talking about a commodity unfortunately that usually has to do with the amount of derivatives, you know, how many paper contracts are bought, uh, either in the, you know, the COMEX or in London or in the over-the-counter market, because it also exists in an opaque manner that the public doesn't really get to see because you can do an exchange, you know, on a contract uh, bank to bank or bullion bank to a uh, hedge fund, for example. So there's a lot of, you know, paper out there. So it's really difficult. But the bottom line is, Physical markets really do have the ultimate say in where these market prices go. And yet the derivatives market sets the price. So 
The reason I think gold's so strong is you've seen central bank buying over the last couple of years. It's been, according to the World Gold Council, the highest it's been in probably 50 years. You see China probably underreports the amount of gold that they're, you know, importing, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. They just keep building their their stockpile of gold. None of the gold mined in China ever leaves. It's uh, against the law to export any of their, their own mined gold. And the awareness in the financial system, where we're starting to see a shift in who's buying gold, uh, not the central banks that's been ongoing as for a few years, but the wealth management types. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, it's a friend of a friend. It's a friend of my sister's known for years. The man is uh, probably not a billionaire, but maybe halfway there. And he's done extremely well in real estate, extremely well in the stock market. And he's kind of left the metals alone until very recently. And he's shifting out of his real estate. He's shifting out of his stock portfolio. He's moving into the metals heavily. And that's an example. One person certainly doesn't build a trend. But I just talked to a really good hedge fund manager of mine yesterday, and we spoke for probably almost an hour. And that's what he's seen. Retail is kind of sitting on the side. You know, the people that have bought, um, you know, through the years and stacked and continue to stack, they're kind of just waiting for a dip or, you know, I've got enough or maybe I bought too much and I'm waiting for that $30 silver to sell some back or whatever the case may be. But the bigger money, uh it looks like it started to come in and this is again from a guy that's pretty connected to the the whole industry and not dealing with a wholesaler knowing almost every wholesaler on a first name basis so that's good information for you and, and our viewers um uh, because that's what moves markets it's the market doesn't care who's buying it doesn't ask hmm. are you retail you wholesale you hedge fund manager are you china it doesn't care the what's important is that it's being bought more than it's being sold and it's being bought in size. And that's what we're starting to see now. Has he also told, has he also told you why he's buying like his motivation for it? Like yeah. why, why, why yeah. did sentiment change? Every, yeah. This is a sea change in my opinion and in his. And again, this is, you know, two people, of course you can talk to other analysts and feel or think the same way, but it's, you know, commercial real estate in the United States is in dire straits. So that's that's a given if you really pay attention. Stocks are overvalued by any metric you want to use, although as you keep printing more money, it's got to go somewhere, and it's been going into the equity market for a very long time. That trend will not change overnight, but the smart money or the early adopters are going to get out early. And the big money's been getting out. I did a, um, on my weekly perspective, I do every week, I try to keep it 10 minutes or less, but I talked about how many big names with huge positions such as Buffett dumped, you know, so much of their Apple stock or other entities, Jeff, Jeff Bales, Jamie Dimon, Zuckerberg, all these people that are in the know that are dumping the stocks. Well, if that's an indicator, people, they're getting out because they can, they're trying to get out as near the top as they can. And so, uh, so then where do you go? Real estate isn't going to work. Uh, stocks are coming, are shifting from a neutral, to a down position, the bond market, good luck and longer term, there isn't a lot of asset clusters to go to. And of course the precious metals is one that's been overlooked for a very long time. So if that big money, those superstars start moving, you know, a portion into the metals, then we really have uh, something that could be, you know, rather breathtaking over the next few years. And I say that with some authority, but go back to the 1970s, no one has the exact numbers. But purportedly, the amount of wealth that was into the precious metals in, say, 1970, in the 70s was about 5%. Right now, we have better metrics because, you know, we spy on everybody doing everything. And we have a little over 1% in the metals. markets. So if that went up fivefold and reestablished itself like it did in the 70s when people were very concerned about a currency crisis and the demise of the dollar, which obviously never happened, then... Uh, and we could see a lot of new money coming in. So is this the start of a flow? Or are you just starting to turn the pressure on the fire hose and you're very, very far from opening it up all the way? I don't know. That's my metaphor. I think that's the case. And, uh, you know, the data will have to back me up. But I've seen it start. I mean, it's undeniable 
that it started, whether it'll continue or not, remains to be determined. When you say like you've seen that it started, like where, where are you looking? What data points are you focused on? Is it just ETF inflows or just the gold price like it, itself? Like what, what are you looking for there? Well, price establishes that it's true, but no, it's central bank buying, really. I mean, they've been kind of the underlying force that no one looks at. I mean, I talk about the run to gold many times, might have done it on our last interview, but you know, the run to gold starts off as a, you know, slow walk and then a regular walk and then a brisk walk and then a slow jog, a full jog, a fast jog, then it goes into a run, then it goes on an all out sprint. And it goes on an all out sprint. It's when everybody everywhere decides they'd rather have gold than the real estate or gold than, you know, uh, the stocks or gold in the bond or gold. In, everybody's rushing to get into gold. And of course, that's approaching the top and that's when you want to let, you know, sell it to them. Uh, we sell it for paper. Well, maybe, maybe not. We'll address that in another interview, but that's the idea. So right now I would say we've just started to walk. The banks have been picking it up in almost stealth manner, unless you follow the gold market like you and I, most people aren't aware and don't really pay attention to because they don't really care. You know, they're too busy working and paying their bills to worry about what the gold market does. But nonetheless, the facts are there and it'll, you know, it will accelerate. I mean, the reason, and the other one's price. I mean, when you got a new nominal high in gold and it's knocking on the door when the stocks are high, you got to remember this is important. The most negatively correlated asset to gold is the stock market. So if the stock market's making new highs, it doesn't mean gold should be making new lows, but it does imply that gold shouldn't be doing as well as it is. So if gold is doing this well in a stock market that's also doing well, it's indicating to me with all my years of study that we're really going to see something on the next major leg up because gold is forecasting, markets look to the future, that um, there's, there's a lot that's going to take place in the next... I would say a few years regarding the precious metals. A hundred percent, David. I want to. I'm bringing up a chart here real quick. I'm, I know you're probably familiar with it, but that's the uh, the one month chart on gold. And one thing I want to highlight is just really that drop on on August fifth, because I want to discuss the role and function of gold uh, in a sell off scenario as well, and uh, the behavior of the gold price and, and gold itself. Uh, is that something when when you look at it? Did you expect that behavior of gold and uh, maybe the recovery pattern as well? Just uh, curious, your thoughts are. Yeah, it is. And, you know, if you look, if you're a technician, you can see that if you go back to, I can't see the numbers really well, 25th, I think, is a low, then like the 6th, and then like the 8th, it's making higher lows. So even though that dropout bottom that you just pointed to on the 5th looks horrible, and it was, and yes, it was expected because these markets are small and they react to the financial, you know, mainstream press, whatever's going on, you know, if you get, a uh, big sell-off and everything gets going down like this, you know, happened with the yen carry trade. Uh, gold participated in it, but it's interesting to note that it's higher there than it was, again, whatever that was a month earlier. And this is a showing the strength technically in the gold market. So uh, not surprised I said it would come back, you know, rather quickly it has. We're yet to hit a new high, but we're in the doldrums. Remember, su the summer's usually the worst time for gold and it's doing really well during the months that it usually doesn't and i do expect you know well over I've, over 2500 here pretty soon and maybe even hit 3000 uh before the end of the year and it's psychological too uh you know these numbers do mean something psychologically because resistance becomes support and once the support level say 2500 then the technical traders will say, you know, I'll buy the dips. You know, it's never going below 2,500. Uh, and so they're more confident actually buying more in an up market. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, people, you know, if someone like my friend, my sister's friend that's made, I don't know, let's say, let's just say five times on their money over the last decade. <clears throat> that's a lot of profit. He's not so interested in the gold price you know, going doubling, he's more interested in not losing money in the real estate portfolio or the stock portfolio. He's got his gains. He's not greedy. He's going to move out. Where do you park it? Well, normally you park it in cash. But if you park it in cash and you're at real true inflation rate of 8%, you're losing 8% a year over, you know, the decade you just build all that wealth, that's going to go away. 
So where do you go? You go to the ultimate cash. You go to gold, the monetary hitching post of the universe, because it's a constant and it's going to preserve your wealth. So he's probably not that concerned that he, you know, gets an appreciation. Now, the appreciation you get in gold may not be relative to the value of everything out there. Maybe it'll double, but so of so the prices on everything across the board double, right? But at least you've preserved your wealth. So there's a lot about gold that people really don't understand. And, you know, they like to think they know a lot because they just paint us with a broad brush and call us gold bugs. But uh, they don't really understand the monetary system. If people really understood how the money system works, uh, they wouldn't be as adverse to gold or the gold price than a lot of people are. But they hear a lot of it negatively from the, the mainstream press and the gold's hardly ever mentioned. And, you know, when it is, it's usually put out of context that it's, you know, well, it's those weirdos or that, that cult or that whatever. Yet, the truth of the matter is the whole system runs on the banking system and the banks buying gold hand <laughs> over fist. So they don't bring that up in the discussion. No, it, 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 lots of interesting factoids in there, especially like I think we had Ronnie Stoeffel on here and he, he mentioned that one of a German comedian or uh, what do we call them? The guys that make satire, like a borderline comedian. But uh, he pretty much called all gold owners and people that like gold uh, Nazis. <laughs> so I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so I, I might have to beep that out here. But um, like you, you mentioned $3,000 gold. Of course, that's an interesting number for us to, to, to target. Of course, we do want to make some take, make some profits. But the question is now, like, does something need to break to get to 3000 Or is that just a continuation of a trend that we're seeing already? Do, do you see any, uh, what do you call it, any, any turmoil on the horizon? Well, I do see turmoil. And then we do have a technical, you know, ceiling right now we're bumping up against it roughly round numbers 2500 so we've got to get over that we've got to maintain over that for a period of time for that to become support but i do that will happen when i'm not sure probably by the end of the year will we get to 3000 by the end of the year that would take some work i think um we've had a good run so far this year we've kept most of those gains in gold we've kept some of them in silver and we would probably, unfortunately, need more negative news, either on the uh, war front, the financial front, um, somewhere in geopolitics, somewhere maybe in the election. I mean, there's a lot of vectors that hit the, the monetary system. And, you know, I, I don't like to be a doom and gloomer, but I am a realist. And let's face it, there's a lot of tension surrounding the, the global empire with the uh, Anglo-American empire uh, actually coming down in strength and the uh, BRICS uh, gaining strength and the turmoil that's going on with Iran currently. And of course, my biggest real fear about warfare isn't the, the kinetic war and, you know, in the Middle East and in uh, the Ukraine. And it's really a cyber war. Uh, not that these other wars aren't very important, scary, and I, I just like them. I mean, let's get that fact out there. I don't want to mislead anyone. My point is that more true destruction could come through a cyber war where you take out a money center bank or you break down where the currency you know, can't trade because of a computer glitches across the country or across the world or whatever. That is uh, what James Rickards has referred to, and I won't put words in James' mouth, but uh, Ice Nine. You know, where things just freeze up and you can't make a transaction. The ATM doesn't work. The bank is closed. Um, they're not functioning properly. Uh, they're not giving the correct ratio between the U.S. dollar and the Japanese yen. Uh, all these things that can happen in the, in the realm of computers. I mean, people don't think very often about how vulnerable we are to a computer, I'll call it glitch or anomaly, that was... Um, directed by an outside force. And the other problem with that is it's very hard to detect if done properly, who instigated it. You know, was it the Russians? Was it the Chinese? Was it, uh, you know, was it some hacker in Australia that's bored? I mean, we really don't know if it's done well. And this worries me because, you know, people's wealth is basically on a computer screen somewhere. I mean, it's basically a memory in a computer. Not that you don't own the apartment building, yeah, sure you do. And you might have clear title to it and all that. But if you cannot, you know, make your mortgage payment because the bank isn't available, now what happens? Oh, that's the next step is like messing with mortgage documents as well, because everything's stored electronically. I was thinking about staking and mining claims, uh, for example, as well. 
uh, since we're talking gold and silver here. Um, David, it's like gold price right now. Like we're trading around twenty four fifty five. Um, you know, the Fed is always a big topic. It's also here on our channel. Uh, the question is like, what what is priced in, in into the gold price right now? And uh, like Fed rate cuts, of course, is a big topic. Uh, market expected fifty basis points. Now we're down to twenty five. Like, h- how influential is that on the gold price? And what is priced in? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm going to tell you my answer. Time will tell if I'm right or not. You know, I've been at this for such a long time. I've learned many things the hard way, and it's probability. I mean, it's not like 100%, but one of the things that I learned fairly early was that the markets look forward. They see the future. And so I think the the next, the first, you know, rate cut that we're going to see after some time maybe in September, probably likely in September. I think gold will ignore it. And I think gold may go down on that day because I think gold's already anticipated. Uh, there's many that would go the other way. But uh, I remember one time, you know, trading gold. I used to trade futures quite a bit. Not, I don't do that too much anymore. But I was uh, long gold and there was some, you know, war thing going on. This is, you know, 25 years ago or whatever. And yet gold went down and I called my uh, account manager and, or my broker and I said, what's going on? I mean, this should be positive to gold and kind of explained to me what I just said. The markets anticipate gold saw it coming and it's, it's, people are selling in the rally or selling it off. So. so that's my take. I mean, but longer term, the monetary crisis continues and the other asset classes are you know, doing well today. Uh, may do well to the end of the year. I don't know. But the, the the real facts are what we talked about. I won't repeat too much. But the amount of insiders that have sold stocks, the amount of problems in the real estate market, and uh, big people that are moving from those two realms into gold, not so much for price appreciation, but for price stability or for wealth preservation. And that's what gold exists for. I mean, it's really not going to make you wealthy uh except in rare occasions i mean when there's really a wealth disparity on the price of gold i'm gonna move on from there real quickly but i wrote an article one of the guys i work with that uh they bought out the lameria royalty company i started many years ago we merged with them and he is asking me something about the price of gold and i said well read an article i wrote about 25 years ago called engineering the price of gold i mean it's How much gold do you have versus how much paper do you have? It's the paper price of gold. And you did that in uh, 2000, about 25 years ago. The price was $2,500 an ounce. Well, James Rickards just did that same basic math a couple months ago, and the price was $27,000. So that shows you how much paper printing has gone on between the year 2000 and the year 2024. The the supply of gold really hasn't changed very much, changed slightly, but the amount of paper has been astronomically increased. So it's a moving target. You know, I mean, the one thing I don't think the public understands is the price of gold going higher doesn't mean that gold's really gaining in value. It's maintaining purchasing power. The dollar's being destroyed. That's what they don't understand. But if you live in India, you understand it. If you live in Argentina, you you live in almost any South American country. You understand that. It's like a basic thing that you probably know when you're a six-year-old kid because these governments always destroy the currencies and they do it fast enough where you can see it. Whereas the United States having the reserve currency status has done it slowly enough over time that the boiling frog is it's boiling now and it's a little bit late to be jumping out of the, out of the pot. <laughs> Good follow up to that. Like you mentioned, the price of gold. Like I've asked that other guests as well. Is gold expensive? Like, or is it perceived to be expensive? Especially, yeah, you know, it's retail? perceived. It's perceived right? to be expensive because it takes all these dollars, and people kind of think of dollars as a constant. You know, I was making you know fifty thousand dollars a year in you know, nineteen ninety, and now I'm making one hundred two thousand dollars a year. I'm making more money. No, you've got a bigger money, but your purchasing power for the general American, their purchasing power has gone down since 1978. But they don't think of it that way because maybe until recently when, you know, groceries are so expensive and have gone up so quickly. 
So when it goes up quickly, people pay attention. When it gradually goes up, you know, the water's a little warmer, a little warmer, a little warmer. They don't really think too much about it. But when all of a sudden it gets in, it gets too hot. It's like, okay, okay, wake up. And that's the analogy I'm using. But no, it's it's just a number. We, and so this is like when you go into the hyperinflation, God forbid that we ever do. I don't think we will, but we could taste it. The point being is, no, it's just a number. Like I said. The same number is, or the same amount of gold has a different number. Why? Why was it 2,500 and 2,000 and it's 27,000 now? Well, gold, this gold stockpile went from 265 million ounces purportedly to 261 million ounces now. So the change in the amount of gold held purportedly by the treasury has basically been the same. But the amount of base money that's been printed has gone up massively. And it's a factor of 10, roughly. So you got 10 times as much. So is it cheap? Um, let me try to do it a different way. I know you understand me. I want the audience to understand me. So when Warren Buffett bought 130 million ounces of silver, he bought it about $4.73, which was the lowest price on an inflation-adjusted basis that's ever been. But the price of silver in the 30s in the Great Depression was 22 cents an ounce. Well, 22 cents is less than 473 by a lot, by a factor of 20. But yet, adjusted for inflation, the 473 number is actually lower than the 22 cents because of what it purchases. And this is something you just got to get through your head. I know you get it. I know most of our audience gets it. So when you go and adjust the silver price to the money supply right now, it's as cheap as it's ever been. It's as, it's as cheap or nearly as cheap as that 473 when Buffett bought it, but yet it's 28 units. But you got to think of these things as just fun tickets. I mean, if you think of it as money, you're not thinking correctly. It's a fun ticket you use at the carnival. And when the carnival leaves the town, it's not worth anything. And the carnival's already packing up and starting to leave. And so you better have something that's worth something after the carnival leaves. Because if you don't, you're going to be sitting there with all these tickets, but you can't use them. You got to buy. You got to get a lot of stuffed toys out of the carnival there. That's so. right. <laughs> no, fantastic, oh. David. I have one last question, and uh, it's I'm out of my depth here a little bit, and I hope you can shed some light on maybe also for, for me. It's the it's the gold or the the price per ounce of gold that is held as an asset in the on the, on the books of the United States. Um, if that makes sense. And that's $42 yeah. roughly right now. 42.22 as per February 17th, 2023. What happens if the goal, if the U.S. starts or decides to revalue its gold holdings and uh, activate it more or less on their books? What does that do to the economy? Boy, uh, that's a tough one. It's <clears> a <throat> big one, I know. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to address the 42.22 because you hear so many, even uh, our genre talk about $35 an ounce. That was true when Roosevelt confiscated the gold, really nationalized is a better term, regardless of make a semantics study. But what happened was, a funny thing happened in the way of the forum, that actually what the Treasury did was they devalued the dollar and they did it against, you know, the currencies. We've just been talking about, you know, $2,500 an ounce, $27,000 an ounce, so they did that. And it came up with 42.22. And then they went, oh, my God, we can't do that. Because when we do that, we're admitting that we're depreciating the currency. We're never going to do that again. So they really did it once and once only. And it stayed at that number ever since. But if we did redo it again, and uh, let's say that we really do own that gold, or the United States holds that 261 million ounces, and they revalue it at you know, 3,000 an ounce, and that boosts it up, what, what would that be, 4 trillion, 5 trillion? Then, um, you know, you'd have a, you know, it's like getting a huge boost into your checking account. You'd have a lot of, you know, free cash to pay bills, to do things. And would it help the economy? It could, it probably would, uh, but it would be temporarily or permanently. Let me explain on it. If you continue to inflate the money supply, it'd be a temporary thing. Uh, it'd be like paying off your credit card uh, in full and being feeling really good and being nearly debt free or or within a manageable debt and life's good again. You can relax. You're not uptight. Paid all my bills. I uh, got some savings. 
But if you continue to inflate, that over time would just put you back in the same situation you've always been. Whereas if you revalued and you live within your budget from then on, it would have a dramatic effect of stability throughout the marketplace. And that's what we want. We want stability in the marketplace. We don't want to have to keep increasing the minimum wage. Why increase the minimum wage? If you, if you left the minimum wage at um, <clears throat> an ounce of silver per hour, you'd be at uh, you know 25 bucks an hour right now uh, in fiat terms. But if you go back to when I started my website, it would be five, you know? So what's changed? Well, the amount of paper again. So, you know, that ounce of silver hasn't changed, but yet I was getting $5 an hour in the year 1999. And now I'm getting an ounce of silver and it's worth 25. So this is a principle of sound money that we're all, we're not cheating each other. You know, the banks aren't, um, you know, working against us, so to speak. And, you know, I'm not against debt. I'm not against banks generally. Uh, I'm against the way the system is rigged against uh, the people at large and what's uh, gone on in the usury. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now, Kai, but did I, did I explain that well? I hope I did because it's important. It's a complex topic because if you look at the total value, as you said, like maybe four or five trillion dollars, we can do the math. Everybody's got a calculator at home, even if you just use twenty five hundred dollars or so, because it sounds like based on the deficit spending right now, it might buy you a year or two. Um, yeah of breathing room if you were to monetize your your assets there maybe activate them on the balance sheet and maybe the debt to gdp ratio will shrink and maybe some lenders will come in and say okay it looks better now on your balance sheet but in the end it's just window dressing right as he said like yeah i mean you have to you know you'd have to revalue everything against it i think i mean you'd have to go to you know twenty five hundred dollar gold and then you'd have to like maybe convert the bonds to gold at a price that um the bond market might not like in terms of paper, but in terms of stability, it would be there. But it's very complicated. It's very tough to do. Uh, it's very interesting to try to figure out, you know, how these bankers are going to get out of this mess. And it looks like they just want to, um, you know, make a blockchain currency and they want to ma monetize everything on the planet. Uh, Whitney Webb has done a great job at this where, you know, they monetize, you know, the forests and the lakes and the mountains and, you know, everything on the planet. Well, that will create a huge asset base to monetize. So now, you know, there is a physical uh, relationship uh, to back the money supply. Because that's what we want. We want something that, you know, is true wealth. And so if they increase the true wealth by monetizing the planet, uh, they could get away with it for a while. Uh, it's very, very sad to think about the amount of power uh, and control that the bankers have over basically all governments, uh, all people, all ideologies, and all all cultures. It's very, very, very sad uh, for me to think about how much power the money system has over, over the human populace. A uh, big topic of discussion right now is monetizing some of the U.S. land uh, to solve the housing crisis, I think, is the big topic uh, in mainstream media here these days as well. Um, David, we got a lot to talk the last five to ten minutes here about silver, obviously. We haven't had a chance to talk about that and, and why the divergence is, as as I was called, drastic. Like, I'm a bit surprised how silver is behaving. At first, you know, it, was, it, it seemed like it was behaving like copper almost. I, almost I, I called it a base metal here on this show a couple of times because that's how silver behaved, in my opinion. It behaved like copper. But uh, and then it caught up to gold. It actually outpaced gold a little bit. But now it's uh, outpacing to the downside. Like, uh, what, what are your thoughts on silver? Like, why is silver behaving like that? It's tough. I mean, silver is definitely dip more difficult to analyze than gold is. And I think you're right. I mean, there's been many analysts over the years that have talked about silver being, uh, you know, they've even used the word bipolar. I mean, sometimes it acts like a monetary asset. Sometimes it acts like an industrial asset. And that's true. And it does both. And the industrial usage of silver was 35% a decade, two decades ago. And now it's about 60%. <clears throat> so the industrial demand for silver just keeps increasing. And that is kind of a floor. That's sort of like a stock buyback program. You know, once our stock price gets to this level, we'll just buy our stock because it's the best use of our free cash. We can't put our cash to use to expand our business. And in this case, the business is the silver market. So we're going to uh, continue to buy. I hope people understand that analogy. <clears throat> so any buying on top of that comes from investment demand. 
And that's been lax for the silver market for some time. And, uh, but it's a very small market. So when you heard some of the better known names on the internet talking about a silver shortage or silver is as tight as I've ever seen, or it's very hard to get product. And all that was true within a subset of the overall silver market. What they're really talking about was retail product was hard to source, you know, government minted coins, hard to source silver rounds, hard to source kilo bars, hard to source 100 ounce bars. And again, that was true. But the silver market runs on commercial bars, it runs on 1,000 ounce bars. And there's very few of them that are exactly 1,000 ounces. They're rough pours, they're stamped. They're, they've got serial numbers on them. <clears throat> they got their mint mark and they're roughly 1,000 ounces. And that's the silver market. That's the derivatives market. That's what these contracts are put up against. And they have to have certain grades from certain refineries. And so that is the silver market. So when they say the silver market is tight and it's very hard to get and all this, well, people don't understand the bigger picture here, a, a partial truth, I'll say, that the silver retail market is very tight. So now it's not. I mean, the uh, a lot of retail sold back in the 30s, and they're happy to do so because they waited a long time to break even, or they bought it at 20, and they wanted to sell half when it hit 30 or whatever the case may be. And so now the wholesalers are sitting on a lot of inventory, and their spreads have come way off. The premiums have dropped substantially from when you were hearing how hard it is to supply silver. No, it's, it's it's true. Like I've been t chatting with Andy Shackman, Rich Checkin, and a couple others, of course, as well over the course of the last couple of weeks here, actually, just getting a sense of what, what is happening. And one thing I couldn't really work out is, is a trigger for the silver price. And uh, yes, gold gold rallying is always good for silver, but uh, that, that trigger that makes silver outpace gold, like, it, like in history, it used to be like three to one ratio that, you know, gold went up 25%, silver usually went up 75%, right? Um, I'm not seeing that trigger right now. Do you have any idea or an inkling what it could be? Well, I like that number. I'll talk about that briefly. But right now, uh, gold is up about half a percent and silver is up 3%. There you go. Now, I look for that three to one ratio, but it has to be established again and again and again to establish a true trend. But when you see days like this, it's hinting that silver does want to move. But it's been um, suppressed. I mean, the... As long as you have enough physical to meet the industrial and monetary demand, silver can be managed to maintain a certain level, very close to the cost of production for a primary silver miner. I mean, most of these silver miners, even at $28 silver, aren't really making any money. I mean, they might on their books look at it, but if you look at their balance sheet and what their actual net profit is, in some cases, it's really not very much, if even a profit. And that's pathetic in any business. I mean, no one wants to run a business to break even or worse, run a business to lose money. And yet the silver industry at large is in that situation. And it's been that way for quite some time. So it's going to take um, investment demand coupled with the non-ceasing industrial demand. So it, all markets move at the margin. The margin is people that want silver for wealth protection. I think gold's going to do its job. Let's say gold gets to 3000 this year. The newcomers or people, and even not the newcomers, let's talk about the, the people that have made a lot of money in the conventional investments, real estate and stocks, like I talked about earlier. And I say, you know what? <clears throat> I've lost 10% in my portfolio. It looks like there's going to be more restrictions on, you know, rent, uh, rent moratorium. You know, they're upping taxes, uh, all the stuff to do my real estate portfolio. I'm going to get rid of these two apartment complexes. And you know what? I think I'll just park it in the metals for right now. By the way, that's kind of weird. You know, silver usually has a ratio on average of about, you know, 50 to one. It's sitting there, you know, 75 to one right now. I think I'm going to buy a portfolio of half gold, half silver and uh, just park my money for a while. And so you take that across the board, more and more wealthy people doing it and average people as well. But if the big money that I think has already started to move in the sector starts to move and go from that 1% of asset allocation to that 5% I talked about in the 70s, that's a five-fold increase. That's huge. Think about five-fold increase in the stock market. And then, of course, people that are locked in with their 401ks 
or their employee benefit program or their pension or their insurance company, they're pretty much locked into a 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds that can't get out. They're the ones that'll be stranded on that desert island waiting for some fresh water because they had very few cases have the ability to move out and into even a gold stock fund or whatever. They might be able to move some of it in the stock market into a mining company or something for wealth preservation, but uh, a lot of them are just going to be out hanging. So um, I think the shift started, as I said earlier, we've gone from a slow walk to a walk. No one's paying attention to that, you know, people running down the street yet, but the move has started. So hopefully I've done a sufficient job on where we are in the market. I wouldn't give up on silver. Uh, if you look at the silver industrial demand going from 20, 20, 2023 to 2050, a uh, graph done by Matt Watson, who's a great analyst. I consider him a friend, not super tight, but we know each other. He shows that we're in a deficit situation as far as the eye can see over the next 10, 15 years where the amount of silver by mining and recycling combined, which is roughly a billion ounces a year, will not meet the demand that starts at 1.2 billion ounces a year and goes out to like 1.5 billion ounces a year uh, 10 years out, which means that the above ground stockpile of silver will be eaten up over the next few years, just like it was from 1990 to 2005. I hear and look at this stuff and it irks because it's my specialty. It doesn't, I'm not trying to ding anyone, but you know, one of these writers in the space says it's the first time silver's been in a deficit. It's not true. <laughs> it was in a deficit for 15 years and yet the price didn't really do that much. This time it's different because there's so much information on the internet and we have a swing between the asset classes. That's the main driver. When people have money that they made in the stock market and the real estate market and they want to protect it and they know it. Or the market starts to give them signal like, holy crap, I don't want to lose any more on my real estate portfolio. I'm going to sell. You know, and now where am I going to put it? Well, I want to keep my I want to keep my wealth. And I know I've said that about four times on the show, but that's the main trend to look for. And to see it early, you've got to have, you know, pretty sharp eyes or, you know, be attuned to the market. And who's leading that? Well, the banks are. No, fantastic. David, one last question. We had Ronnie Stoffler earlier on uh, oh. on the show here, like earlier this week. And he said, we're in a bull market and in the bull market, you buy the dips. Do you agree? I do. Yeah, Ronnie does a good job. I'll just have to shout out that uh, one of the guys that works for me at the Morgan Report writes the silver section of that gold report. So <laughs> we're pretty well recognized even by Ronnie Stoffler. No, fantastic. Awesome. That uh, And on that bombshell, we're, we're going to end the conversation here, David. I really appreciate your time. Where can we find more of your work? Yeah, just go to themorganreport.com. And if you're interested in my documentary about this whole big mess called The Money System, go to silversunrise.tv. I'm making a documentary on uh, the stress and strain of uh, the money system and what we can do about it. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll link to that down below as well uh, in, the, in the show notes here, of course. So uh, we'll, we'll send people that way as well. David, it was great to see you again. Thank you so much for your time and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this was insightful for you. If it was, please leave a comment, leave a like. And uh, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel. Roughly 80% of you watching are not subscribed. Let's change that. It is much appreciated. It helps us bring guests like David on the channel more regularly as well. And to invite other great guests too. So please do that. It helps us out. Let us know how we're doing. Leave a comment. As I said, uh, how are you positioned? What is happening? Uh, what are you seeing in the market? How, how are you doing in your real estate portfolio? Have you have any really curious and uh, want to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financial. Thank you.